All right, hi everybody. My name is Emily Salvador. I'm a second year master's student in the object-based media group. I am so excited to bring some of my friends from Walt Disney Imagineering here to speak to you all today about experiential storytelling. Um, I wanted to thank a couple of people, so thanks to my friends, family, and colleagues at the lab who are watching both in person and online. Hi, Mom and Dad. <laughs> um, and yeah, and so uh, we're going to have a live Q&A panel at the end of this talk. Um, if you want to use the hashtag MLTalks on Twitter, go ahead, and then we have a website that's going to be posted on the screen up there with a, with a link to get to. Um, so Disney recently became a member of the Media Lab through Michael Abrams at the Walt Disney Company, and we're very happy for them to join our member family. Um, and now I'm going to have Sarah Thatcher, Dave Fisher, and Amy Jupiter introduce themselves. Great. Thanks so much, Emily. Thanks for having us here. <laughs> this is really great. We're really, this is what a sensational place to be. Thank you all for opening your, opening your labs to us, inviting us in, and coming to hear us talk. Uh, my name is Sarah Thatcher. I'm a creative director at Walt Disney Imagineering Research and Development. Oh, yes, thanks for having <laughs> us. Uh, I don't want to make any gender assumptions, but you might know who I am uh, based on the names that are up there. <laughs> I'm the guy. I'm Dave Fisher. I am a story editor. I am in the story development studio at Walt Disney Imagineering, and we'll talk more about that later. Hi, I'd like to also thank you guys for having us. Um, I'm Amy Jupiter, and I'm an executive producer with Walt Disney Imagineering. <laughs> Somebody's next, excited. Next, next question. <laughs> yeah, cut off. Time's up. Exactly, <laughs> cut off. Um, oh, and before, before we get too deep into the talk, I am just like overwhelmingly happy by how many people have showed up. We're working on getting more chairs, so hang tight um, and head on up to the fourth floor because there's a little bit more space up there. Um, great, so let's get started. Uh, earlier today, we were talking to Joey Ito, the director of the lab, and he mentioned sort of the driving forces of the media lab is um, uniqueness, impact, and magic. And I wanted to ask each of you what those words mean to you in your role as Imagineers. Um, I want to start. I just, I just want to talk a little bit about, I think, unique. And uh, people often ask us about what the Disney difference is. Um, and I think that we take uh, very traditional things and use them uniquely. Uh, uniqueness is a part of sort of what Imagineering is, um, being a state of mind. Uh, so using things in, 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 uh, in unique ways. So I, and, and then having them impact our, uh, our guests. And uh, magic, obviously, unexplained science. And uh, so those actually are really meaningful words to us as well, I think. I, I, I think um, you're probably going to, there's going to be a pattern here um, when we start to answer these questions um, because one of, one of the reasons is I probably am going to be providing a lot of the historical perspective <laughs> on Imagineering just because I've been there so damn long. Um, I've been with Disney for 40 years and uh, yeah, yeah, if you can believe that. I, um, yeah, I'm only 39, how about that? Um, <laughs> And so you talk about magic and uniqueness, and, and you know, I think back to how Imagineering got formed. I mean, you think about Walt Disney. You know, Disney, uh, first and foremost, considered himself a storyteller. But hand in hand with that storytelling was creating new ways of telling those stories. I mean, this dates all the way back to 1928 with Steamboat Willie, which was the very first synchronized sound cartoon, 1937. Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, which was the very first uh, animated feature-length feature -length film. Um, so when it came time to do Disneyland, he was again doing something different, uh, something radically different. Uh, a lot of people called it Walt's Folly, and the reason they called it Walt's Folly was because they thought that it was just going to be uh, just this spectacular failure and no one was going to come to this place. So it's in this spirit that the Walt Disney Company and Walt Disney Imagineering in particular continues to exist is that not only are we continuing to tell stories uh, in magical ways, but we're also looking to tell them in unique ways. And one of the unique ways we do that is through you know, changes in technology, uh, changes in philosophy, changes in the way people experience uh, the things that we do. So I think we're gonna spend a little time talking about that today, but that's, that's sort of, yeah. again, the historical perspective. 
Yeah, and I, and honestly, when we were when we were hearing that kind of credo of the of the media lab and just in kind of taking in the the ethos of what it is that everyone here does, I just felt so much resonance in uh, and I I feel I feel so much. Uh, so much similarity between my work as an Imagineer and what's, what I see going on here. Uh, there's so much joy in living in that area between, between art and science, between engineering and imagination. And all of the, each, each one of those kind of credos in the way that Dave was just talking about kind of enter in both into the experiences that we create, but also our kind of methodology of creating them. So I feel a lot of kindred souls out there. And, and to pick up on Sarah's talking about, when we see something on YouTube or we come to the MIT Media Labs and we see stuff, we, we, you know, the, the gears start like, Completely. oh, you know, what can we, you know, because you guys are doing the same thing. You're trying to figure out practical applications for the things that you do, things to make the world better, things to help us in what we do. You know, we're doing the same thing. Well, maybe not make the world, but happiness makes the world go round, though. So, um, so we're thinking about ways that we can take some of these brilliant ideas and turn them into the stories that, uh, that we tell in our theme parks. Mm -hmm. And I would say a lot of Media Lab students are storytellers because we meet with lots of different people and other students and other companies, and we need to be able to explain our technologies in ways that these people can imagine them being in their lives. So I'm curious how each of you approach storytelling, especially being from such different departments, and how you integrate technology into your stories. Sure. Well, I guess I, I have a similar, coming from advanced development and research and development, have a similar task of figuring out what the, what the, what the story and what the experience is that technologies enable. So I, I, I feel like technology is, it's, it's, it's another tool, it's a paintbrush, it's another, it's another piece to build an experience with. Uh, and a lot of the work that, a lot of the work that we do is figuring out, well, here's a new cool thing, what is it good for? What could it be good for? And experimenting and then feel, figuring out how to convey that to people like, like Amy and Dave, who are ultimately going to take those and bring them to the field, bring them to the guests. For me, I, I often, you know, I specialize in, in large format ride films. And so when we get a story um, from our writers, um, oftentimes we are charged with learning um, or how to express those using different forms of technology. And, and often, um, you know, we're, we're, that is, that is how we approach storytelling from an experiential uh, standpoint. Because I'm, we're really going to move you, literally and figuratively, um, with these with these large rides. And uh, while we call them attractions, which is the integration of all of the uh, the movement and the film and the sound and the um, and all the other aspects of effects that we use. Um, oftentimes, that expression is the is 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 the story is your, the, the guests experiencing it is how we, um, how we deal with story. So um, it's really quite interesting. And it's amazing because as Emily said, storytelling is a part of all of our lives. We begin telling stories even before we can speak. Um, for me, I, you know, certainly I was very interested in writing when I was growing up, but um, when I was uh, in college, I went to the University of Southern California, a little school out in LA, and I majored in English and journalism. And you know, I really thought that I was going to be a journalist. You know, I was going to be. This was the time of Woodward and Bernstein. You know, people were breaking these fabulous stories about Watergate and things of this sort. Um, but at the same time, I grew up near Disneyland, and as a senior in high school, I got a job at Disneyland as a sweeper. You know, the guys who go through the park and they sweep up the popcorn and, and everything that our, guests, uh, that our guests drop and keep the park really clean. And it was fabulous because going to the University of Southern California, it was very close by. So I was able to live at school and work at Disneyland on the weekends uh, to pay my way through school. And when it came time to graduate, uh, two things happened. One is that, as I was joking with them earlier, I got the opportunity 
this was way back in 1983, I got the opportunity to go to Japan. We were just opening Tokyo Disneyland, and uh, I got to teach the Japanese how to sweep. Um, don't argue, you know, <laughs> there was a lot more to it than that, but it sounds kind of cool, right? You teach them how to sweep, because they don't know how to sweep. And at the same time, I had graduated, and now, you know, when I came back from Tokyo, I'm ready to move on. I'm not gonna be a sweeper anymore. And so I started, you know, as many of you have done, will be doing, looking for a job. I was interviewing with newspapers. An opening came up in marketing at Disneyland as a marketing copywriter. And I ended up taking that job and it took me in an unexpected, uh, an unexpected direction in my career. Not only writing as marketing, but also the fact that three years later, uh, on the recommendation of my boss at that time, he said, you know what? You're, you're doing much more for marketing than we deserve. You belong at Imagineering, which, you know, I was like, thank you for saying that. And I found myself at Imagineering. I've, I've been there for about 30 years. And during that time, I really got a chance to explore storytelling, not only practically creating the attractions, um, the shops, the restaurants that I hope all of you enjoy when you go to the parks, but also studying storytelling itself. Um, I mean, internally, we do mentoring programs. Um, I host an entire program on storytelling where I tell Imagineers, no matter where they come from, engineering, architecture, about storytelling. And like everyone else in the world, I also have a podcast. Um, <laughs> it's, it's called Story Builders. Unfortunately, you need to be an Imagineer to listen to it, but we talk about story. And it's interesting because usually I'm on your side of the microphone, so to speak. I'm doing the interviewing, so it's kind of strange to be You'll have to let me know what I did after. So I may end up asking you questions, Emily. So. <laughs> So anyway, I hope that sheds a little light on, on story. Cool. Well, so earlier Amy was mentioning that imagineering is a state of mind. And I think that storytelling is really about creating these emotional connections. So how do you um, adapt stories to suit um, such a wide range of audiences from children to adults, different genders, different cultures? How do you approach that? How do you make emotion accessible to everybody? Well, I guess since... I'm the center of story, I guess, so to speak. I can kind of start to tackle that, and then you guys can jump in. Um, you know, everything we do at Disney is based in story, whether it's motion pictures or it's television shows or even our parks. Um, we may not literally tell you a narrative story when you get on something like Pirates of the Caribbean or, or the Haunted Mansion, but it's based in story. It comes out of story. And many of the characters and stories we bring to life are stories that were brought to us by Disney Animation, Pixar, Marvel, Star Wars, all the wonderful uh, intellectual property companies that uh, Disney owns. Um, so the idea for us is to take those stories and to turn them into something that you're not just looking at, but something that you're experiencing. And hopefully you're experiencing it on a more and more personal level, which I guess you can speak to. Sure, yeah. So I think one of the amazing things, we're, 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 we're such narrative creatures. We're constantly telling our, ourselves stories. There's, there, you're constructing, every day you're going throughout your day, constructing this narrative of your life. And the same thing happens, uh, what I think about what we do as constructing kind of the, the tools for you to tell yourself that story of we're, we're, we're giving you, we're giving you environments, we're giving you characters, we're giving you, uh, we're giving you perhaps a way to move through that, but really you, you the guest, are, are the storyteller in, in that. You're actually putting all of those things together. Uh, when, you're, when you're going through, say, the Haunted Mansion, what you, what you particularly notice becomes your story of that attraction. Uh, and so each person gets their, in that way, gets their own individual experience. And then as we've been kind of pushing, pushing forward and exploring more uh, new, new frontiers and new varieties of, of ways to bring those stories to life, there's some more opportunities to make those more personal and more responsive and interactive, and I, I, a lot of my work focuses on those. Well, not to take your job, Emily, but <laughs> funny you should mention the Haunted Mansion, right? Yeah. In terms of a project like that. Sure. Uh, let's see. Well, let's let's Sorry. see how not let's see bad. how we do here. Uh, can, can you can you bring up the the ghost post? Thank you. So. 
Thank you. <laughs> uh, so, we, so in, in trying to figure out, so the Haunted Mansion is it's turning 50 next year. This is, this is an attraction that has been around for generations at this point, um, has reached uh, guests in all sorts of different ways. And so going to that... Sur survived Eddie Murphy? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you didn't see the movie? <laughs> Aww. Aww. Uh, so, so the, it's been it's been through many generations of both Imagineers and also of guests who have fallen in love with it, and uh, it has it has a really deep group of fans out there who the the six minutes worth that they spend on the attraction just could could never be enough. They're they're looking for how do I. How do I how do I how do I live Haunted Mansion? You see just some amazing guest creations of the rooms of their houses are given over to Haunted Mansion, and uh, there is a lot of passion and love for this story and this place uh, that Imagineers brought to life over uh, half a century ago. And so, going into this with a lot of respect uh, for for Imagineers before us, we we said, well. How do we offer those guests who really want to spend more time with that and actually be a part of that world? How do we offer them that opportunity? And so we put together this project. We, we, we consider this as, as a, a live prototype that we put out into the world. It's, it was a limited run. Uh, we called it the Ghost Post. And what it was, was um, a few years ago, we, we basically made an offer to 999 foolish mortals uh, who wanted to be part of the world of the ghosts, to help, actually help the ghosts out with a very uh, grim problem that they were having. Uh, and they could receive these boxes at home. And these boxes were filled with artifacts. We can go to the next slide. We're filled with artifacts from the from the attic from the from the mansion and so really putting pieces of the mansion in our guests hands and going beyond that and in the 50 years since the mansion opened its gates uh we now have these we now have these personal computers in our pockets uh our smartphones and so leveraging that as a way to have all of these objects interact and have them interact with uh, our guest devices so that they could bring a little, those ghosts could actually come to, to visit them at their houses. And then as they're playing along, as all of these objects are interacting with each other, or interacting with their phone, they're tuning in through their phantom radios, uh, they're able to help the ghosts out with their dire problem. And uh, then any time that they're coming to visit the park, they're experience of the Haunted Mansion actually changes. So we're able to ch change the audio on board the attraction so that it dy would dynamically change to suit what our guests had been up to at home. So they were building a relationship with the ghosts as they're, uh, as they're playing along at home, as they're helping the ghosts out with their problems. So they're not just any old visitor to the mansion. They have a special relationship with the ghosts, and so the ghosts address them in that manner. And so as this unfolded over the course of three months, uh, they could come back as many times as they wished and, and that story would evolve in the park as well as at home. Wow, very cool. Individualized. Yes. Oh, yeah, I think that's the idea brain. because that's one of the challenges we have uh, as, as Imagineers as well is that when we're creating our parks, we wanna make very personal interactive experiences, but at the same time, we need to get you know, 2,000 of you th an hour through our particular attraction because if we don't, we're gonna have some very dissatisfied guests on our hands. So we're just constantly trying to think up and leverage new ways to bring a little bit more of this personal, interactive nature to these things. And this is one of those ideas that we've been working on as well as many others. Speaking to um, personalization and interactivity, how do you constrain uh, that narrative experience so that everybody still has the high quality Disney standard of storytelling, even though they have control of where the story is going? You're way ahead of us. <laughs> what, are you looking for a job? <laughs> Boy, that is, that is sort of like the million dollar, or not million, million dollar, no, uh, billion dollar question now. Uh, 
you know, we, can, we talk about personalized experiences or individual experiences, and I, I don't, you know, interactive or real-time responsiveness to, in the attractions. <clears throat> Excuse me, I think, um, I think that is where we're starting to go. And if anybody has been on Flight of Passage, uh, which is at the new Pandora World of Avatar, um, there are lots of different um, interactive or real-time or responsive um, effects in, in the whole land. The whole land is sort of on what we call a, sort of an interconnect. And we have control of all of these aspects that sort of respond to you or talk to you or, or um, respond to the time of day. Or they, um, the, if when you get on the, the uh, flight of passage ride, the, uh, there's a, you know, a, a piece of technology that, that acknowledges you. It, it, the seat turns on and, and, and you have a, uh, there's a camera and you can see yourself. So everything that sort of makes it so that you're having this, while well, in a very big communal experience, the individualized experience as well. And I think that it's not necessarily like the, the evolution of using technology to further the, the, you know, the creative immersion you know, into these attractions. I think that that's where we're, you know, where we're going, what's important to us, that the, that the attractions actually, you have a relationship with them. And so as you get on your Banshee, using all of that sort of personalized technology to uh, have you feel like you're in control of it. And so what is it to fly? And uh, I think that that's, for me, and in this iteration of the use of that technology, and, and as we find more and more ways to um, use it, I think that's, that's, gonna, that's the really special for us too. And I think we're starting with a good base because really just visiting a Disney park is a personal experience. Um, John Hench, a Disney legend, once said that, you know, Disneyland was the very first form of virtual reality. Um, because if you think about it, if, you, if you're going to a movie or you're watching a television show, I mean, you're looking at a screen, the director is telling you where to look, right? Wherever he points the camera, that's where you look. But when you come to our parks, you're actually walking into the movie, so to speak. And so you're building your own story, you're, create, you're your own director slash cinematographer. And I think that already gives you a personal experience above and beyond what you could have before. And I think our next step is, as Amy said, is to take our individual attractions and try and, try and push those boundaries, push those margins uh, so that you, know, you, get, you, get, you get an experience that's drastically, or maybe not drastically, but different from the person who may be in the car behind you or maybe even sitting next to you. Well, we're, you're, the guest is the protagonist in the story. We're building a world, and you guys are navigating. You're, you're creating your own plot. We don't use plot um, like, you know, like a traditional linear storytelling. You're creating your own plots, and, and depending on the park and depending on the experiences or the land that you're going to, you're creating your own experience, your own plot throughout the, uh, throughout the land. And so I think that that in and of itself, it's not just like you're distant. We're composing as if it were a sort of a, a, a screen, like we have wide shots and we have medium shots and we have cross dissolves and between our lands. And so we use a, a lot of the same vocabulary that traditional media or traditional filmmakers will use. But again, you know, this, this whole, you can look wherever you want. And so you're creating your own adventure yeah. in, inside of our parks. And in terms of, you know, taking a story, I hope all of you are familiar with Pirates of the Caribbean, which is an attraction that opened in 1967 at Disneyland. It's considered one of the, one of, you know, one of the classics. And when you think about that, it, there's no narrative storytelling going on there. You're taking a journey in three acts. So, I mean, there are still some story structures. You know, the first act, you're going through a bayou, very quiet. Then you go down a waterfall into caverns where you see these skeletons, act two. And then finally, act three is the pirates coming to life. And, pillaging and looting a town. Um, so we do have, we do have story structure. Um, we're just not telling narrative stories often in the context of, of these rides and attractions that we're creating. Maybe to, uh, to evolve on that, because one of the things that I've, I've found interesting, being the relative new, newcomer to Imagineering compared to my colleagues on stage here, uh, one of the things I've been fascinated by is the evolution of how uh, we think about our guests' role in the story. So you look about, you look at, and, and how our attractions and experiences have evolved as, as that has happened. So you look at uh, one of the opening day attractions of Disneyland was was Snow White's Scary Adventures, That's and yeah. in the original uh, there was no Snow White. There was no 
you, you went into, there was a big, big uh, sign over the, this big stone. It said Snow White's edifice, Adventures. Snow White's scary, and there was no Snow White. No. Uh, and uh, early guests were, you might understand, a little bit confused. Upset. By looking for where, it said Snow, on the label, on the tin, said Snow White's Scary Adventures, <laughs> where is Snow White? And the, the intention of the Imagineers was that you were Snow White. You were the person who was being offered the apple by the witch. Uh, and so this was, you know, maybe didn't come across, was a little bit confusing. We're still getting our sea legs under us of... I'm trying to get back to pirates um, <laughs> of uh, how how to how to do this, the, but the desire was there from the start of how do we give our guests a role to play in the story, a part not just make them uh, not just make them sightseers, but actually make them participants. You you also touch upon a good point is that you know when we take these familiar stories and we put them into our parks, what do we do with them? Uh, in that particular case. Uh, Snow White Scary Adventures has, let's, let's just say there isn't a long wait for the attraction. And we actually put Snow White in the attraction when we redid it way back in 1983. We completely redid Fantasyland at, tomorrow, uh, Fantasyland at Disneyland. And we put her in, but essentially what this attraction is is what we call internally a book report. It's basically just telling you what the movie was, which is very difficult to do on an attraction. Um, and besides, you know, you're not giving me anything different that I didn't already see by watching the original Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. And it, it led to some funny problems with this attraction. You're going through it, you meet the Seven Dwarfs, um, you meet the witch who offers the apple to Snow White, and the very last scene is the hag, she's up on top of some rocks and she's trying to pry some rocks loose to go down on you and the dwarfs. Oh, no. And we ran out of room in the attraction. So then you came out and it said, and they lived happily ever after. <laughs> so, okay. so I think one of the things we try and do as Imagineers is, is to somehow bring something new, something fresh to these stories. And it's nothing new. I mean, Walt did it uh, back in 1955 with Mr. Toad's Wild Ride, which has always been one of our most popular attractions. You get in this little vehicle and you careen through the... Uh, through, through the countryside and through Toad Hall, and it has a truly unique Disney ending because it's the only attraction where you end up in hell. Um, sorry, spoiler it's for, it's alert. It's for the kids. Yeah, it's for the kids. Um, but what, what the Imagineers did is that they didn't try and retell the story of Mr. Toad. They took an element of the story, which was Mr. Toad wanting a car, and they turned that into an attraction using his personality, because he's wild and he's crazy, and what would Mr. Toad be like in a car? And so that was, I think, a very successful way of taking an existing intellectual property and enhancing it in our parks in a new and different way. And so you mentioned, you mentioned pirates earlier, and that's an attraction that's had some, some, a lot of evolution, both in the original and uh, You're trying lately. to get me in trouble, aren't you? I, I'm, I'm trying to, <laughs> I'm trying, I'm trying to cue we actually have media. Oh, uh, <laughs> do we? She's we directing do. the conversation. Yes. Oh, are uh, you? Okay. <laughs> so Amy was actually very integral in creating a totally revamped and innovative version of Pirates of the Caribbean for Shanghai, and we were hoping that she could share some of her lessons from that. Well, you want me to set it up first with the old one? Yeah, please. Um, so Pirates of the Caribbean, as I said, opened in 1967, and then in uh, 2001, 2002, uh, our studio released a movie called Pirates of the Caribbean, Curse of the Black Pearl. Very, very successful movie. Uh, Johnny Depp is Captain Jack Sparrow. And so naturally, um, now people didn't necessarily associate Pirates of the Caribbean with our attraction. They were associating it with the movie, especially since there were going to be more movies coming out. So while filming was going on for uh, Pirates of the Caribbean 2, Dead Man's Chest, we made the decision, let's put some Disney characters into the, let's, uh, let's put some of these new Pirates characters into the attraction. So we put Captain Jack Sparrow and we put Captain Barbosa. Um, but this was sort of a band-aid. This was just introducing these characters. But now, with Shanghai Disneyland, we had an opportunity to completely rethink pirates. Yeah. 
We did, and we wanted to take you on the journey um, as Jack Sparrow has hidden his gold, and we are on this adventure, and he's, he's, he is uh, protecting it uh, from Davy Jones, and he has to go on this adventure under the sea. And so we have this very, we have a huge attraction, um, which is very technologically advanced, but we're still going on a journey, and we're gonna take you on a journey um, to, to find the, the, the treasure, and then we're gonna battle. It's called the Battle for the Sunken Treasure. And it, um, it is a huge, like in a footprint, it is a very big attraction. So we're able to use a lot of projection technologies, a lot of huge sets, a lot of, um, a, a lot of advanced animatronics to tell this story. I mean, and you actually um, go underwater. We actually take a dive underwater and there are people who have come, our guests who have come and wanted to know if we were actually going underwater. They'd look and they'd try to find all the places that we dug down into actually going to, these, uh, to this very amazing journey because these domes are, are 100 foot wide and, and 75 feet tall and, and, and you are absolutely immersed in these giant battles with all these effects and, and it's, it's really immersive and it is an emotional experience for people to actually be transported down into the water and, and, and mesmerized by these huge sets and huge and if we could have built everything we would have, but the mixed media of it is actually part of the, the, the illusion, the creation of illusion of journey, of this journey uh, um, underwater, and you can see how, how, how big these, these domes are, and I, I wish we had, had actual video to show you, but I, I don't think we do, uh, but they are, um, we worked with our, our partners at ILM, uh, part of the Disney family, uh, to create these um, amazing scenes, and I, I, you know, like if you wanna ask about what it is that you wanna show share about it because it is, um, there's so much to well, share about. Yeah, I think something that everybody here would be interested in is how do you merge um, existing workflows and processes with the unknowns of exploring new technologies? Like how do you approach that when you're building an attraction that's as innovative as this one? Hmm. So everything you see in our attractions, there's a lot of traditional film, at least in my, in my world of, of, of ride films. Um, there's a lot of very, very old, 100-year-old methodologies that we use. And really, you know, our job is to make the technology disappear so you feel like you're in these worlds. And so using technology to empower the creative process, make it shorter so that you can get more out of the time that you're spending on the attraction. So we only, you know, we, even though, you know, you're, you're convinced you know, our, the people who are stakeholders to invest a great deal of time and energy, and which translates to money, into these attractions. So you want to get as much refinement as possible, and the technology really empowers us to learn more about our attractions earlier on. So we'll build them in what we would traditionally call, and I, I can't believe they're saying traditional VR. And so we're <laughs> using some of these immersive technologies that we're using in our design process. You know, if we could have done this in real time, we would have, so we program in real time. We use these real time tools to empower the iterative process so that we can explore what it is that, how we tell the story, where I put your eyes, how do I make the illusion of moving and diving down? So in order for me to learn this, you, you actually, you were either in a headset or, or, or on the, what we'll call a holodeck, um, to, to understand the attraction earlier in, in a digital version. And then we use these, the large attractions as they're building, remember, you know, we take these parts and pieces, we, we design these things on traditionally, like on pieces of paper with paintings and, and as targets for us to hit, and then we have to figure out how to dimensionalize them. And so we, we, we do this really early in our process, and then we go away, and three years, four years, it takes to actually realize these huge buildings. And so then traditionally we'd come back and go, okay, so this is where we are and we'd start from scratch to say, okay, let's start to program this from scratch. And now we can actually start really early in our process using your, like what you guys would use as, as, as um, uh, you know, the software that you guys know, like Maya, and we'll work with all of this sort of uh, technology up front to, to design um, in real time or in, in, in the digital world, and we use the attraction to verify that what we've, we've, we've um, imagined and what we've built actually works. That remember, we're, 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 we're moving you, um, literally and figuratively, through these environments, and in order for us to know if they're in sync, that they work together, that the emotional impact that we're trying to, to, to take you on, you know, journey through, 
actually is working. So technology really just empowers our design process and our iterative process, and then obviously the display. The display is, um, we use a lot of technology in the display. And, so. and I would say just as a, I didn't work on this project so I get to gush about it, uh, is, is just the blend between, in the, and it's really, it's a testament to how successful that uh, merged process is in using those digital pre-visualization tools to be able to understand something, they're making something at this epic scale. These, how tall are the, how tall are the? They're like 75 feet tall. Whoa. There, <laughs> it, 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 is, it is a scale that is, is be, you know, architectural, beyond architectural, uh, and combining that with equally epic-sized media and the understanding how those elements interlace just wouldn't be possible without these, it wouldn't be possible no. to, to end up on opening day as successful as, as it is without these pre-visualization tools, without the, you know, being able to ride it together before it exists. And I, I think that's the uniqueness of, of sort of the Disney difference, the ability to use all these tools, glue them all together, the infrastructure. Like if you think about all the inputs that, you know, that we control all of the photons, we control all of the, and I'll call them irtons because, you know, irtons, photons, the control of the rides, uh, the ride tons, all of that data. <laughs> they're really the, you know, sort of like, there's so much data that we're controlling. It's not that, the complexity of that in and of itself you know, there's the static asset set of the building and all of the sets and how those things go together. Those are different groups. There are 140 something disciplines that make up making a theme park. So even just as a communication tool, as a team building tool, all of these things helped us collaborate. What is group collaboration? And how do you use the tool sets to collaborate, communicate? Um, and, and I think that that's really like to make, these are communal experiences and that is something about you know sort of the they're social and 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 heads up and, and you really want to you know that's where we're using our technology I think is is is, is illusion design. Mm -hmm. So another question for Amy and Sarah, um, I'm curious to know how you take something from R and D that's been prototyped and and demoed to maybe a couple tens or hundreds of people and then robustly proof it to be put into the parks? Because I know Amy has, has championed a couple of projects to move from this R&D space into a space where guests get to enjoy them. Sure. So we'll, we'll, we'll take two examples uh, at massively different scales uh, that have transitioned from out, out, of the, out, of the R &D, out of the lab and into the world uh, under, under, Amy's, <laughs> under Amy's care. And uh, so, th so the first one, if we can go to the Navi Shaman, please. So the first one is this, uh, is this, is this figure. This, uh, she is, uh, represents a step forward. Imagineering has been making uh, what we call audio animatronics since the very early days, since, since Walt got fascinated with... Do you with, want me to step in? Please, please step in. <laughs> I'm, I'm Historical basis, only, please. Yeah. So, so audio animatronics dates back to 1963 with an attraction called the Enchanted Tiki Room. Uh, the name, like the name Imagineering, which is a combination of imagination and engineering, the name comes from animation and electronics. The audio portion comes from its early operating system, which was actually tape. So imagine, you know, for any of you who remember eight-track tape, um, I believe that Abraham Lincoln was a 12-track show and, um, and uh, Enchanted Tiki Room was a 24-track show, I believe. So at any rate, these early versions were called A1 figures. They were very limited in movement. In the 1980s, we went to A100 figures, which uh, incorporate compliance technology in order to make them, in order to allow them to move much freer. But at that time, they were also just pneumatics and hydraulics, and that sort of picks up the story now with, yeah. with uh, what are we calling this an A1000 figure? Is that what we're calling Oh, I, I think, I where think. Are, I think A1 million? <laughs> I don't think, I think she's the shaman of, shaman oh. of songs. Yes. Yeah, okay. There you go. She's the shaman of songs. There you go, it's story, not <laughs> technology, <laughs> Absolutely. right? Absolutely, yeah, like she's and, her individual. And, and as, we're, and as we're, we're looking at this evolution, you know, this, uh, 
you know, Walt was fascinated with this, with this uh, being able to capture something that felt alive, this liveliness. And, and we, wanted, we yeah. wanted a consistent performance for all of our guests. So, uh, yeah. so in, in, going, in going after this figure, we're, uh, we're sitting at R&D and going, okay, well, uh, the, this, film, these film, this film by James Cameron just, pr just places a massive gauntlet. And when it came out, if you remember, just the incredible emotion that he was able to get through the through that motion capture process be able to bring these bring this these this uh, world but also the creatures that inhabit it to life uh, in a way that really I mean I, I I remember going to the theater and going I I've been transported and so as as we're as we're thinking about how do we make this a place that you can actually visit and the how do we do how do we bring these uh, Navi to life? They're enormous, and they're incredibly expressive and emotive, and how do we do that justice? And so actually going back to the very same techniques that the filmmakers use to be able to do motion capture, to be able to capture that hu the humanity of that performance, and create a animatronic figure that can uh, that that can actually perform in an equal way, and I I we don't have any video. I, mean, I encourage you all to go look at video or just visit her in person. She's in Florida, uh, <laughs> yeah, on Pandora in Florida, uh, and because the expressiveness of her face alone is astonishing. And as you guys, I don't know, is, is there a show of hands? How many people have been to Disney's Animal Kingdom? Nice. nice. Okay, so animals are to Animal Kingdom like magic is to Magic Kingdom, right? So everything starts with the animals. So when we make story or when we make um, uh, parks, we talk about the themes of the park. And so for, um, for Aunt Disney's Animal Kingdom, it is about animals, so it is the sanctity of nature, that nature is immutable, that everything starts there, she always wins. Um, and then, of course, the transformation through adventure. And so you're gonna go on your own adventure and you will have, because you have done this, you'll go see the world through new eyes. You're going to a place called Africa. You're going to a place called Asia. And you're going to a place called Pandora. So how does Pandora fit into this really, you know, sort of th that IP? And also, you know, sort of like, okay, so how do you, how do you, how do you fit it in? And so we start with like themes. So the Immutable of immutability of nature, transformation through adventure, and then when you know better, you do better. So the call to action. So we talk about you know protecting in indigenous folks. We talk about protecting animals. So that everything that we did in Pandora goes through the same filters, so that it fits naturally in Animal Kingdom, and so. Part of you know, our audience that, um, that were Avatar fans told us that they wanted to, the, you know, the things that they wanted to do were meet a Navi, go to a bioluminescent forest, and of course, um, fly on the back of a banshee. And so things that you're like, that's a really... It's a tall it, order. Yes, exactly. That is gonna be really hard. But if you go back to the basics, and, and part of you know, going to see a Navi and the Shaman of Songs, there's a whole sort of the Navi culture. What is that to immerse our, 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 fan, you know, our fans, our, our the fans, our guests, into that culture. So those themes are, are rampant. Everything in Pandora runs through the same thematic work that we worked on um, uh, for Disney's Animal Kingdom. So I think that that's a, a really good place to start. Well, and maybe even talk a little bit about where the story of Pandora takes place in the timeline of the Avatar films. Right. I think so, that's really interesting. Yeah, so, you know, again, animal, at Disney's Animal Kingdom, we're introducing you to the world. And we're hoping that, that going to, these, these, to Africa or, and going to see the animals of Africa and going to meet the people, um, you know, it started out it, it, uh, thematically as a Swahili first park. So if you'd address someone in Swahili, they would speak back to you in Swahili. So, you know, you want definitely cultural, uh, you know, authenticity. And so when you go to Pandora, it can't be just about Jake and Natiri. It, it has to be about Pandora so that you can bring your own story to Pandora. So the, the land takes place 
way beyond the conflict, way beyond, like this is now sort of a cleanup site. You can see nature starting to take back the, the RDA that, you know, to clean up from this, the polluters that were there. And so we separated it completely from the movies so that other stories could happen on and Pandora and that also other stories are gonna happen on Pandora. Like we knew that the world would extend. We, you know, we knew that there would be sequels. And so we wanted the world to be evergreen and ever fresh and so that different stories could happen on Pandora much like different stories happen on Earth when you go to Africa, when you go to Asia, so. Yeah, and so I feel like it might be easier to make something feel evergreen or like it can um, stand the test of time a little bit more when we're dealing with places, but how do you approach making an intellectual property evergreen when it's about the characters, right? So like Star Wars or Marvel, for example, it's so much about I mean, I would, I would actually say Star Wars is about the world. Right. It's, it's uh, I mean, yes, there are, there, are many, there are many characters that exist within that world you may feel an emotional connection to, but it's, it's the world as much as, as, any other, as any other piece of it. And that's really in thinking about how to bring that to our, to bring that to our parks. We're, we're, building, we're building a planet you've never seen before, but it, but it feels familiar because it's that world that you have fallen in love with. And so the, it has, things like Star Wars have, uh, have, iconic, uh, have iconic characters. Have I, you've, seen, you've seen varying versions of the smuggler archetype before. You've seen varying versions of somebody going on that hero's journey. And that happens throughout this world. So it's about visiting the world rather than about visiting the character. And I think there's some I think there's some great examples where it is where where the characters are are very key. But Star Wars I would I would actually argue is very much on the on the world right. on the world side. Well, you, you can also expand your definition of character. I mean we just Absolutely. showed the Millennium Falcon. That's a great point. Which, you know, for a lot of people that is a character. And to Amy, when, you know, when we were scoping out uh, Pandora World of Avatar, it was like, okay, our themes and also our sort of must-haves. What would people want to do here? We went through the same exercises on Star Wars Galaxy's Edge, and of course, one of the top things there was, man, would I want to go in the Millennium Falcon. And we're going to take it one step further. We're going to actually allow you to pilot the Millennium Falcon. So, um, you know, that's, and, and, to, and again, to Sarah's point, Again, not necessarily retelling the stories from the movies, but building this world, this new world, which is the great thing about Star Wars, building this new world that's going to have a whole bunch of new stories that our guests are actually going to be able to personally experience. And where you can live, live your own Star Wars story is really the goal. Yeah, I think it's really interesting this transition to where guests are becoming characters in the universe as well as being visitors to the park. Mm -hmm. Do you guys think that that is a cool evolution and is how are you expanding on that or how do you explore that as maybe Dave, you as a story writer, how do you try to create these moments for guests to be characters? We're giving them opportunities both formally and informally. Um, you know, you look, it, it's not something new. For instance, uh, you can be a Jedi right now in any of our parks. Um, you can become a princess at Bibbidi Bobbidi Boutique. So there are these opportunities to take an active role immediately. Um, but I think Star Wars is gonna take it to, to another level in terms of actually making guests feel like they're part of that landscape, part of what's happening there, I think more than we've done in the past. Yes. And, and then you have the, you know, the Marvel Universe. And so that becomes a little bit different when it comes to those. That is a character-based universe. Yeah, it's hard, to, it's hard to build that world. I mean, what do we got? We got Asgard. Well, Asgard doesn't exist anymore. Right. Um, and a lot of that world no looks spoilers. like ours. A lot of that world looks like ours. It certainly does. Right. And so that, like, th there you go. How do you know? How, do, how can you tell it's an, an alien place? Like all of our design vocabulary, but, you know, the connection to the world and the connection to the characters. You know, we talk about experience. You guys, you know, our guests really want to be connected to it. And, and, and actually connection, at least in, in Pandora, leads to these sort of wanting to do something for them, with them. And I think that you guys on, on Galaxy's Edge are going to really like 
be participating in those worlds, participating with each other. Remember, this is a social sort of medium, a communal medium. And I think that you know what's different about that in games, and then you're extending the medium. But we we work in a very social and communal medium, and I think that you guys are are really pushing the the envelope in as far as you know interacting with each other, interacting and interacting with the with the world. So. So yeah, right. speaking of interacting with the world, um, sort of combining a lot of these things, interactivity, characters, um, and storytelling, can you talk a little bit about your robotic characters that maybe can feed off of emotional resonance of your guests? Why, sure. <laughs> so this is, this is another project that uh, started, as, started as just a little bit of wild R&D brainstorming and, well, what if, and... Uh, if you can go to the uh, mission breakout, uh, and ended up uh, actually getting into incorporated into another thing that Amy Amy worked on, uh, and really this this project started with this uh, concept of we not the building, but <laughs> this is where they live. Uh, this is where they ended up living. But before that, they were they were in the lab, and it was really about how do we have we have so many. Uh, we have so many characters that uh, are just performers that don't that I, I, that will will try and make eye contact, but it, it's. Can you bring up the tiny life a, slide? Yeah, the little the, the bird like the creatures. The space one. bird the chicken little, little right. little, <laughs> Yes, little bird thingies. The fluff. Balls. There you go. Yes, Aww. there we are. Perfect. So they live in that big that big house. They've been collected by the collector. But before that, they were this idea of how can we make uh, our animatronic, our audio animatronics, how can we make them responsive and, al and alive and really continue to go after this, this living quality? And part of what we said at R&D was, well, it's not just part of being alive is, is reacting to the world around you, is being present. And so giving our, our little Vilus some, a little, bit more, a little bit more sensitivity to the world so that they can respond, so that as, they're, as guests are walking by them, they, they, they're in the, uh, in the queue area as you're going through the collector's collection. And so as we're playing with them, they're, uh, they're, as you're walking by them, they do actually make eye contact. They do actually react to you. And we actually, as R&D, uh, really want to give our, uh, really want to give the creators of, of our attractions and the, the widest possible palette of tools. And so looking at the emotion of these characters and how that's portrayed so they can actually be dialed in. So you can have one that's a little shyer. You can have one that's a little bit more aggressive and kind of bomb, uh, bombastic and give that to our creative directors, give that to our designers to be able to dial those personalities in. So it's really, you know, this is a, actually a really sort of good tale of how something will go from things that are in complete development and how we have, like you guys have open houses. And so what we did was, you know, while we were making um, Guardians of the Galaxy Mission Breakout, which is, you know, obviously you can see the tower. It's about, you know, the collector, which is from the films, um, has this collection, this, this, this fortress where he collects things and they're held um, hostage or collected. And um, we were going through open house that year um, with Kevin Feige, um, the person who is the, uh, the producer from, from the, all of the Marvel um, Cinematic Universe. And um, we looked at the, uh, yes, there it is, the tower, and our, or the fortress. And um, we, uh, we were like, what are those? Those are cool. And there are these, the, we actually spent like an hour cool. talking, right, an hour talking to these creatures and these little creatures are responding to us and we're like, so, uh, I very quickly realized that we could put them in the movie and that we could put them in our attraction. And so actually it was a really good um, sort of uh, relationship between both from an R&D perspective, from an actual practical making of things that work in an attraction, and then also informing the cinematic universe. So the dimensional universe and the cinematic universe starting to have a dialogue with, it, with each other. So that b extending the world building that we're doing just based on 
on are this, you know, the, the Marvel Universe. And so now you can go to the Collector's Fortress and you can meet the Vailu. And you can, and that you can actually, while you're standing in line, you can actually interact with them. And if you're really loud and boisterous, they're really lo sort of like loud and boisterous listening to you. And, and, if they're, and if you're sort of like really quiet, they're sort of like just in resting. <laughs> and so, you know, it really becomes something that the, the dialogue between development and implementation um, and then also sort of emotive, experiential storytelling that extends our universes both from cinema and into dimension, it it's, was a great sort of example of how this happens yeah. and organically too. Which and was awesome. Absolutely, and I and I'd say from the from the R and D side, it's actually it's also a great story of starting from an experience first of going, well, we make we we, we just we just made I, we 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 had all at, at R and D lived with that shaman figure for <laughs> years, and you know we made some made some large expressive things and thinking about okay. If we go, if we go after the, something that's small and expressive, and what does it mean to be small and expressive, and just how small and how minimal can we get in terms of giving it life? And so this started out as um, Le uh, colleagues Leslie Evans and Corey Rouse with a literal, just a just a, a hack together puppet, a uh, little felt hand puppet going, okay, how, can, how many ways does this need to move? How many different expressions can we make out of a relatively small range of, of motion? And how can we create that connection? And then, forming, and then using that to inform, well, what kind of sensors do we want? Uh, what, kind of, uh, what kind of motors do we want? How do we want to make these come alive and literally give them the tools to grow into the dream? I, I think it's also an evolution of, again, audio animatronics. Um, I mean, these guys see their genesis uh, back in a character that we created back in, in the early 2000s, uh, Lucky the Dinosaur. I don't know if any of you were able to see Lucky. And the tremendous thing about Lucky was he was autonomous, um, but he was autonomous in terms of his movement. Uh, in terms of what he did, um, we had complete control over that. Uh, Lucky was the last remaining dinosaur. That's why his name was Lucky. <laughs> and uh, nobody even cared about the technology. He pulled a cart, and in the cart were his batteries, his operating system, and his operator. But when you, when you got together with, like, you never thought of that. You just thought about this wonderful personality that this dinosaur had. And then from there, we went into Muppet Mobile Lab, uh, based on the Muppets, Dr. Bunsen, Honeydew, and Beaker, Wally. Mm -hmm. from the movie WALL-E, so evolving up to this point where now those were all controlled. So just a, a convergence of all of these things for your smaller scale, running independently, completely autonomous, boom, that's where we end up with right. this. Mm -hmm. And so I, I don't know if we got the, the Jake... Oh yes, the next. Uh, so speaking, oh, really, we can speaking, talk about we that. Can. Oh, he's we can been, he's oh. been out. He's been out. I know he's, he's been, been out, out at Disney. Yeah, I know yes. he has. Uh, the, nope. next okay. the next, the next, the so, next generation. Yeah. So we we have. Um, so in thinking about how our our animatronics can our animatronics can and our characters can become unanchored and can and can totally autonomous. To we're, we're, we're we're headed around. to Westworld territory That's here, right. aren't we? So, so to give you, you guys are already working on this too, right? <laughs> yeah, so to give everybody in the audience a little bit of context, Jake is a robot that, we're, that, that Disney is exploring to be able to put in front of the guests in a way where guests can walk right past them and not have it collide and cause any energies, uh, injuries, but also have it be interactable so that everybody can... He's, he's completely autonomous. He mm -hmm. is not being controlled by anyone. He is just mm -hmm. merely out in the area. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of that work is really still on this very core of how do we express character and emotion through, uh, through movement and expression and how, how do we do all those things, of course, safely and with all of the challenges that a theme yeah. park environment presents and people are unpredictable and crowds and all of those things and allow that character to roam 
uh, safely and interact with our guests. So giving us, again, continue to increase the palette of tools that we have. He's, he's, he's roving around. He's had a few maiden voyages out in, uh, because as R&D, we, uh, we do a lot of things inside of the lab, but because so much of our work is about, is about people and interacting and understanding how our guests interact with things, uh, if we leave it in the lab too long, then we miss out on all of that, and we don't understand the thing that we're building. And so uh, Jake has been out on some maiden <laughs> voyages in Tomorrowland and, uh, and getting to see him interacting with guests and seeing how guests respond to him and then continuing to iterate on how we, how we think about De continuing to develop that so that it's ready for uh, for folks like Amy and, and Dave to take out to the field. And yep. as a lot of master's students are learning at the Media Lab, evaluation is critical when you're making any new technology. Shout out to Thesis Prep. Um, <laughs> so I want to ask one more question, and then we're going to move on to the Q&A. So everybody remember that you can send in questions on Twitter using the hashtag MLTalks, or go to Slido. Um, and enter the code uh, X052 to ask your questions. Um, so my final question to you all is, for better or for worse, people have a relationship at this point with their phones. You know, it's something that they have in their personal lives that they bring with them to the parks. Do you think that that is a distraction or an enhancement? And how do you, as storytellers, either draw them away from their screens or integrate screens into the experience? Sure. Well, first of all, it's a reality. Yeah. So we have to deal with it. Yes, it is, it is part of our guests' lives as much as anything else. So but. acknowledging it, I think, is the, always the first thing to do. <laughs> but I think as, you know, as, as we have more and more successes with some of the sort of our, our, our handheld devices, our mobile devices, and releasing things on them, I think that we often, in our, in our theme park environment or in the parks environments, talk about heads down behavior and heads up behavior. And it really is about when it's appropriate to have hands down behavior and heads up behavior. And remember, this is you're with your families. We want you to be with your families. We were really into sort of that communal experience, and so you don't want it to be antisocial. So really just knowing sort of physiologically how you use it, when you use it, when it's appropriate to use it, and acknowledging that it exists, and it's a really big part of our lives. And that it's also a designable surface. Right. So, you know, we're... we're and this is something that's a little new for us as Imagineers who are used to controlling the whole world, uh, literally building it, building it from the ground up, that this is a device that our guests are bringing in, that uh, they're, bringing, they're bringing their own lives in on, along with it. They're maybe streaming something that is not, is not a Disney thing. They're, and what they're, what's going on here is we finally said, well, you know, that's a designable surface too. We don't have to, we don't have to ignore it or be scared of it. We can actually use this to create and enhance your experience of the park. And so we uh, put out uh, Disney, Play Disney Parks, which is, uh, you can all download it and take it on your next adventure to the park. Um, it, and it basically brings another, it brings a little bit of the park to your, to your personal device so that you can, instead of being heads down, actually gives you a new way to interface with the environment. We're being able to build in some, uh, a little special effects, some magic that the, that the phone can interact with, but also really encouraging you to interact with each other. And so our parks are really about having an experience with your family, with your friends that you're there with, and using this to enhance that. And I think that's a key point, that we do have this, this uh, Disney Parks Play app where you would be looking down at your phone, but even in its interface, we're encouraging you to play the games with your family, yeah, with your friends. Right. With the, in fact, you can't play the games that's without right. them. So even in this, even, even with your phone, we're encouraging you to not solo yourself or silo yourself in the line, but to actually communicate with the people near you. So even then we're trying to, uh, trying our best. And it enhances, I think, the, also the experience of, of navig navigation 
you know, how to get to eating, how to get to, it's not, you know, the practical aspects that you use your phone for anyway, like getting, an, you know, a, a car or getting transportation or getting, like knowing when things start. So it really is sort making of- Making reservations at the Blue Bayou. Absolutely. How to, you know, how to enhance your, and, yeah. and make it easier for families to navigate the park and, and make plans with each other. So I think that too. And also like to check your memories, collecting your memories, you know, which are to these sort of, they grow in value. They're an investment for you. They, you know, they, they're, they're an intangible, but we, we're giving you a way to, to, to make sure that they're, you know, that they're saved and collectible and that you can share them when, you go, you know, when you're at home and with each other. Great. Well, so now at this point, we're going to shift gears a little bit and we're going to move on to the Q&A section of the talk. Um, we've got people sending in questions online. Remember, use the hashtag MLTalks on Twitter or go to SlideO to um, ask your questions. So um, uh, the first question I think we want to look at um, somebody had, had asked before, I just want to answer it just so that everybody knows. Um, somebody asked what was the relationship with um, Disney and MIT, and you know, we're happy to share that Disney has recently become a member of the MIT Media Labs member community, and that means that hopefully this is the start of a very awesome partnership where students can learn from Imagineers, and in turn, Imagineers can learn from our students. Um, and so now we're going to... Um, open up the, the questions to our panelists. And uh, let's start with from Anonymous. Um, what do you think is the most important, uh, interesting or impactful new technology that you've seen introduced at the park since you started at Disney? Oh my goodness. To oh, don't to toss it to me. I was hoping that it <laughs> Again, I, I just, what I'd love to just reiterate about technology yeah. is that, you know, you there go. is, if you, if you went and knew, if you knew how much technology is actually in all of these attractions, obviously we're using a lot of technology and, and, and newness and, and, and being able to use it and, and sort of the little de-democratization of it, the accessibility of it, it really is just about using a lot, there's so much available to us as makers and, it's, and that is more, way and more accessible. And so using a lot of technology, there is technology everywhere, but we don't want to put that between you and, and the experiences that you're having, right? But we're using we're using it to empower the guests to have a, just a, a, uh, a more individualized experience, or or a more connected experience, a more engaged experience. How do I, we engage you? But also just to to make the attractions do more. Um, and so there's, there's so much um, technology in there, and we really like we don't like to acknowledge it only insofar as it, it at some point it, it's it's really all the glue together to make the experience. And so you guys, you know, that's, that's where we want to talk about it's, technology, I if think. We, yeah, if we've done our jobs right, it fades away. Yeah. Right. Or it feels like magic. Right. You know, and, and the technology that helps us tell our stories is also helping us, they're giving us tools that help us do our jobs even better. We mentioned the digital immersive showroom a little bit earlier on. And I mean, one of the impactful things there is uh, if any of you have been on Radiator Springs Racers, which is part of Cars Land at Disney California Adventure, all the way out in California, of course. Um, this attraction opened in 2012. We actually started writing, so to speak, this attraction in 2008. And when we started writing it, we were actually able to make some substantive changes to this experience during its development, like adding at the end, adding in one more dip through a cavern that wasn't there before. So tools like this are enabling, enabling us to figure things out way before we build them, because obviously, you know, we want to make the best possible attraction that we can, and it's a lot easier and cheaper to change it in the design phase than it is to change it in the construction phase. And, and also, has anybody been to Gardens of the Galaxy Mission Breakout? Anyone? All uh -oh. right. So, there's a Halloween show as well yeah. called Monsters After Dark. And that is a 30 minute changeover to a nighttime experience. A whole new show. And the reason we can do that is technology. But it literally, the experience becomes 180 degrees different. And so that's technology lets you do that. And that was empowering to us as creators to be able to change the whole feeling of a whole attraction by just pushing a button. So I think that that too, so that you guys have different experiences for the same, like you go during the day and you see one thing and you go at night, it's a completely different experience. 
Okay, great. We're going to take another question. So um, Catherine wants to know, can you talk about the tension between personalization and scalability, and how do you see technology helping um, to change that in the future, expand on that in the future? Yeah, I think we touched on it a little bit earlier. Um, sure. Uh, yeah, I mean, our, our, our business has to work at scale. We have we have many, many visitors to the parks every day, and so designing for that scale obviously is a, is a requirement. Uh, for me, it was a big mental shift. Uh, I, my previous company also made immersive experiences. It was a three-person company. We made immersive experiences for, for you know, maybe several thousand. Uh, at the most, and so the difference between those scales is it is enormous, uh, and I think one of the one of the pieces that's really something that I think about a lot is being able to uh, as as an inter as designing interactions and designing for for interactivity in that personalization is how do I how do I give choices that are clear? How do I make that interactivity accessible? Uh, so that that I'm so that I can teach you how, and invite you to play in this quickest time possible, and so that's a and it's a great design challenge because if you can do that, it's like it's the old Mark Twain thing, but for design, if you can well attri attributed to Mark Twain, if you you know if I'd had more time, I would have made it shorter. Yeah. If you're a really great designer, you can you can make it succinct and make that invitation and how do I interact and how do I play. And also, the personalization aspect, you need to put it in context as well. As Amy said, you know, one of the reasons you come to our parks is for a communal experience with your family, with friends. So when we design something personal, like Toy Story Mania, where you're actually competing with your friends, um, I mean, you're competing with your friends, right? You're not, you know, you want to get the high score, but you're also, there's a friendly thing That's going right. on, a friendly competition. So I don't think we ever want to eliminate the fact that the reason these parks exist in the first place was for, a fam for adults and children to have fun together in an environment such as this. So it's, it's, it's this constant balancing act that I think we're doing in our parks. And I think at the heart of it, our parks are personal because they're visceral. Because you're, because you're there and you're there with your family, you're there with your friends. But that visceral quality is really, it's the special thing about getting to be an Imagineer, of being, being able to have that, it, it feels personal because it is, because I'm experiencing it. And whether, whether or not, you know, we, it's not about sticking your name on a thing or allowing you to, you know, the, the, the feeling of it being there just for you. Cool, so we'll take another question. Um, the questions have been rolling in, so thank you everybody <laughs> for asking all these amazing questions. A really fun one that came through um, was what is the craziest or weirdest hack that you've done to prototype or proof something out? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Whether I mean, it be like making a like, puppet or... I mean, you just, so there, you know, what is it to prototype a ride? What is it to understand a ride? You know, it's like, and that's like driving through parking. I mean, there are crazy things like driving through parking lots and swinging yeah, sure. things around and, and, yep. and you know, and, and in she's, safe ways. She's talking about the Seven Dwarfs Mine Train roller coaster down at, uh, down at uh, the Magic Kingdom in Florida where we literally got on the back of a pickup, a flatbed truck, with the ride system, and some guy drove us around. <laughs> Just to see what a swingy thing would do. You know, so definitely, like, they're, they're, you hack everything, to, like gaffer's tape, a lot of gaffer's tape, string. Um, there are all crazy things. I mean, like you guys. I mean, I don't, yeah. like, what else do you guys, there are a lot of crazy things going on here that you hack. I think there's, there's some tradition at MIT about hacking right. and, uh, and, and, build, and taking something that, you know, may, may look like a car that you put on top of a dome somewhere. <laughs> and you're, so... There, like, you, I, this is I, a thing. I mean, there's the legendary story of, of, of Soren yes, over that's California. Yes, a great example. Yeah, um, one of our engineers, um, he was trying, you know, Soren, in case, you're, in case you're not familiar with it, is an attraction in which you are, you are, you're supposed to be on a hang glider flying over California and now around the world. And so we were working on this ride system, and Mark Sumner, who was the head engineer for that, he... You know, these guys are working on, you know, gee, they tried out using um, 
a dry cleaning system. They tried this and they tried that. And well, finally, he, uh, over Thanksgiving one year, he went home to his parents' house for Thanksgiving dinner and he pulled his erector set out of the, out of the attic and he started fiddling with it. And by the end of that four-day weekend, he had assembled with his erector set what became the ride system for Soren over California. So, you know, that's a hack, right? I mean... Uh, well, absolutely. <laughs> and I mean, Imagineers sit there and make connects versions of everything. A absolutely. Right, so. yeah. I mean... I mean, I think the, at the heart of it is we're, we're challenged with this job of making things that don't exist. And so virtually everything starts as a hack is how do I, and, and how do I, you know, we know eventually we're gonna invest a bunch of money and do it the right way. How do I do it yeah. the quick way to understand what this yeah. thing is? Right, what does rapid prototyping of a really expensive ride system look like? Right, yeah. I mean, often you it can looks only like driving around in a pickup truck. <laughs> right, exactly, so like you can absolutely imagine what that might look like. I mean, if you guys, if someone said you, you know, you have to make a flying banshee, what do you imagine that prototype might have looked like before we could actually put a machine to it? Yeah. You know, it's like, what is it like to fly? So. so see, bottom line, we all share the same DNA. Right. <laughs> The same ethos. That's why we're here. I mean, because we do share the same yeah. ethos. And yeah. we were as interested in what you were doing as you yeah, are absolutely. obviously in, in sort of like we're, we're doing that dialogue. We're really excited to be partners here because I remember because I think that that partnering that like Imagineers are everywhere. You all are Imagineers. It's the way you think about things. And so we encourage all Imagineering, you know, everywhere. So. Um, Another great question that came through was how has your career in storytelling impacted the way that you tell stories about your personal lives? Just Are make there... it up all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Those terrible hacks that we're now trying at home, right? About you know swinging from a roof or something. But uh, yeah, it, it affects every. It, it affects the way you approach your life, I think, in storytelling and and the narrative of your life or how you live your life and what your focus groups of one. I, I find myself really watching so many more people and how people use transportation, how they use you know. Um, anything, how they use anything, how they experience yes. their spaces. We walk around here, how do you use your spaces? What does the public space mean? What does private space mean? What is collaboration? How do you get people to collaborate? How do you get introverts to collaborate? How do you get people who are super, you know, sort of like not used to articulating? So uh, it, af it, affects yeah. the, it affects everything in your life when you're constantly thinking how to, how to watch how people are in the world, how they experience the world, so that you can bring that narrative back into sort of your work. And so a lot more observation, I find, for yeah. me, definitely. For me, it's been more of a practical application, as I, as I said from the start, is that, you know, I've, I've gotten this fascination with sort of the science, the emotion, the how we build stories and how we tell stories. Um, you know, doing a podcast and doing an entire presentation to Imagineers. I mean, I thought I was just going to write stories, and now I'm <laughs> trying to help people mentor the next generation. This is how we do the stories. Um, you know, and not to mention that, you know, I'm, you know, like a lot of, uh, I'm sure we have, a, there were so many people out there who creative writing, I mean, I mean, we're all trying to eventually write the great American novel, although I don't know what that's gonna look like in five years, so um, that could be the next hack. Oh, interesting. <laughs> um, so somebody also asked, where do you guys see augmented reality fitting into the parks in the future? Well, I, I mean, I think, in, in part, it's actually easy to see our parks as being augmented, augmented reality. reality already. <laughs> yeah. I completely so, agree. Yeah. We're taking the, people out of the mimetic and moving them into this fantastical universe. Right. So, so in that way, I think we've been thinking as creators of augmented reality for, for a long time before there was XR, VR, AR. Uh, as a as a discipline, obviously, you know, Disney had its own part to play in the emergence of VR uh, back in back in the day of Disney Quest and enormous CRTs counterbalanced on uh, <laughs> counterbalanced with a with a big counterweight so that you could fly on an Aladdin's magic oh, carpet. Even next to the Walt Disney Imagineering Lab at Innovation. There you go. Nineteen ninety four. That's right. <laughs> uh, but we, but we've been we've been making. We've been making, we've been augmenting reality to transport you to different places for, for, for since Imagineering years. started. Yeah. yeah. Uh, 
so it, it's and again, just I, I, just to hark on it, we, to answer the to answer the heart of the question, the specificity of the question of it's it's an, like everything. It's another it's another it's another tool. It's another technology. It's another paintbrush. I mean, some of you may be aware of uh, if you've been on the Disney Cruise Line. Right. Mm -hmm. um, we have two ships, the Disney Dream and the Disney Fantasy, where we actually use augmented reality in the inside cabins. Um, because obviously, if you're in an inside cabin, you have no view. But what if you put a porthole with a virtual view and you augment that with Disney characters, then hey, you got a new way to sell your inside cabins. So. And the ocean is suddenly yeah. a little more alive and, and every a little once, more yeah, characterful. Yeah, exactly. There's a, there's a storm bruise, and yeah. all of a sudden, there's, there's, uh, there's characters from Nemo. And out your window, and you see the same thing, you know, happening through, throughout the ship of midship detective agency, true, yeah. and you're bringing the where you're or uh, throughout the sorcerers of the Magic Kingdom, where you're bringing, you're augmenting little places, little niches where you felt like, oh, that's just a wall, or that's just a painting, and now yeah. they're coming to life as you play, as you interact with it. So it seems like all of you wear at least a couple of different hats. How do you balance uh, your both technical expertise and creative passions uh, in the day-to-day -day at Imagineering? It all comes, I mean, I personally, m my job is about creative expression. I just happen to use all these different technological tools to, to help bring all of that together. So I, it's, it's, they're so connected. Um, storytelling, but I, again, we're creative people f first and foremost, I think. Even if you're a technologist, you're being asked to, to hack or bend your mind in some way that some sort of like interpretive dance storyteller is trying to tell you what to do in there. You know, when we, when we made Flight of Passage, we have, you know, Joe Rohde um, is a very expressive person and he wanted to, the, the last sort of the third act of it is a ballet and he kept trying to explain the ride profile of what he was doing <laughs> by, by, by doing this interpretive dance of this ballet of the, of the banshees. And so we're like, hey, we're gonna go down to Lightstorm Entertainment, we're gonna put you in a motion capture volume and we are going to capture your interpretive dance so that the most direct way is to give a director the tools to express and have that become our first ride profile. So that we really were like the, the sort of, it's really meta, but it's sort of like make you, technology helps us to separate the different parts of this creative process into very focused sort of tasks. And then you sew them back together, but it really helps this direct expression of a, of a creative person. And, and that's, it is really like, what is the fewest amount of words that this person has to use in order to express themselves? And technology really helps, helps that. And I, I would say as a, as a creative director within Imagineering R&D, uh, my role is 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 doing is doing both and actually going both directions. So I so as often we start with that emotional place and we have an experience that we want to create. We have this this ghost post that we want to allow the ghost to communicate, and then we go out and look for well, what are all we have these computers in our pockets? What are all of the ways that we can? use and abuse those sensors and, the, and all of that computing power to create the experience of the ghosts coming to, your, coming to, you, coming to you and visiting you at your home. Uh, and and how, can we, how can we do that? And so that involved both going out there and asking that question and inventing some new things. Uh, and two, it works the other direction of, well, we have this really cool thing. I don't know quite what to do with it. Uh, and so we, uh, you know, I work with so many talented uh, technologists, uh, artificial intelligence experts, roboticists, and thinking about who are, who are constantly thinking about what's the new technology. Uh, and I get the amazing job to say, well, what experiences could we make out of that? And inviting folks in from uh, from from the larger group of Imagineering to help us think about that and figure out, well, what are the experiences that this enables? Right. So Dina wants to know if you can tell us a little bit about how you um, test your attractions and interactions um, before you put them out in public. Well, we have people called golden butts. <laughs> <laughs> 
you gonna, you gonna back me up on this? We, uh, so, so from a, from a, from a, what's that? Play testing. Play testing. In the, I was starting with specific. In yeah. the, in the, you know, starting from if you, if you are going to move somebody around, having somebody who is super sensitive to movement and can really articulate all right, this movement is making me feel this way and this movement is making me feel this way and then taking that out to every discipline and you start with the specialists mm -hmm. and then you go out and play test and understand because... Among ourselves. What even. I... Yeah. We're our own best little audience, test audience, right? right? How do we test it? And imagine your kids are some expert play testers at this point. They, the amount of articulate uh, critique of a new attraction that a 12-year-old Imagineering kid will give you is, I, is humbling. <laughs> Very. But I think you're right, because we're, we're, you know, about us actually being the guinea pigs in many cases, because, I mean, most of us, there's a reason we work at Disney. I mean, we're big fans of what we do. I mean, it's a great company to work for. And I think we want to see everything succeed, and we we really want to like these things as well. Um, but I mean, there's from, you know, testing ride systems is one thing. There, there are other attractions that we can test in-house. Um, going back to Toy Story Mania, which we mentioned a little bit earlier. Mm -hmm. um, did you work on that? I, that was before okay. my time. We actually had one of the pods set up in our, uh, in our concept lab. And uh, not only did Imagineers play it all day long, but we invited people from the neighborhood and Imagineers kids, as Amy said. So there are, there are many different ways that we can do this, but sometimes it's instinct, like a roller coaster, you know? Um, right, we all want it to be finished before it's done. A lot of things, you know, then again, technology empowers us to try to experience some of this um, early on, and uh, we use a lot of off-the-shelf type of things to test out what is the least amount that you need to move people, move them emotionally, move them physically, what is the least amount? So we test all the time uh, to see sort of like what's working, and because there's a lot of parts and pieces. And as, uh, you know, we, we, we each, you know, pride ourselves in being experts in our own fields and bringing our kind of uh, depth of experience, some of, the, some of us longer than others, and being able, to, being able to bring that to bear on what we're designing, but we're all, at the end of the day, individuals, and because the story, because that experience is ultimately happening in the minds and in the bodies of our, of our guests, being able to invite them in and uh, invite them, whether in the form of our peers, in the form of our peers' families, uh, to be able to test and play test those things and understand, being able to ask afterwards, well, you tell me, what happened? Yeah. How did that feel? And remember, a theme park is a living thing. It evolves. We're able to sort of modify and evolve in, in ways that the, our guests tell us everything we need to know about Ch what's change working. Change out attractions that right. aren't working. What, and, exactly. It's, yeah. There's an iterative process. I mean, it is a living thing. And so the dialogue between our guests and us is an ongoing thing. And, we, and like, you know, it's a requirement to really, like reading guest letters and reading the, the way people feel about the attractions and, and how they respond to instructional Videos. We always are like making sure that people understand what they're doing. So and, testing goes on. And I guess we We're could sum it up. Time, well, I guess so we could sum oh, it up with Walt sorry. Disney, <laughs> who said, you know, he loved working on the parks because he could shape them. I mean, when he did Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, it was in the can. I can't make any more changes. It's done. But the park is a living, breathing thing that we can continue to change and improve and make better and have people come back again and again and again. As is with all of our work, I imagine, it at the lab and at Disney. So one final question, because we're reaching the end of our talk. I imagine there's a lot of you in the audience that are interested in learning more about how you all became Imagineers. Do you have advice to the students about how they should practice or how, how, what you learned that made you exceptional Imagineering candidates? Sure. Uh I mean, my, my story is, I guess, the more, the more recent. Uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll start. I, I never thought I'd be an Imagineer. I, I had no idea. I didn't grow up in a family, a family that went to the parks. I didn't grow up in a Disney household. Uh, most of my Disney parks experience has been as a professional Imagineer. <laughs> uh, so I... Um, 
but it, but it was one of those moments of it was it was perfect and i was out making experiences i was out making immersive experiences it's so nice that we now can all agree that that's a thing uh, and being actually you know getting i got i got a call from an imagineer who was trying to do something and had heard about my work and said hey would you would you come consult and then one thing led to another and i i <laughs> it's, it's worked out. Uh, my parents are also really glad that they finally can understand and explain <laughs> what it is I do, because for them, saying I make immersive experiences wasn't really helpful. So saying I'm an Imagineer and being able to ground that in, in the parks, even though they don't go <laughs> themselves, that's a thing that they understand. So that was very exciting for them. <laughs> I, too, never thought I would be an Imagineer. I did not know what it was. We were not a Disney family either. Um, but I got an internship because of just things that happened in my life. And um, I tried very hard not to be an Imagineer forever, like thinking, this can't be it. And it just got, kept getting more and more interesting and more and more engaging. And, and so, but the access, you know, you guys all have access to us. And I think that that's the really important part about this, the membership, is that you all have access and there are, there are people in the audience, there's Emily. Like if, like if it's Imagineering is what you want to do or a place you want to work, remember, I believe that you are all Imagineers just by being here at the, at the lab or at the school. And, um, and that is just a state of mind. So it's not, so if it's access to the company, you already have it. We're already sort of in dialogue about being like access to Imagineering. Yeah, and I would add from my experience interning at Walt Disney Imagineering, part of it is just being curious about a lot of different things and wanting to pursue many different skills because <laughs> at Imagineering you wear a lot of different hats. Um, and so being able to both practice and then um, create works that you can talk about to other people that, that involve many different processes and disciplines can only help you if you're interested in becoming an Imagineer. In, in the, just the spirit of being really curious and going after something that fascinates you, uh, there are over 140 disciplines <laughs> at Imagineering, and so there's, it, if you're fascinated about something, chances, chances are it overlaps with something that Imagineering does too. Uh, so be, be, be fascinated, be excited about what you're making and try, try making new things. Yeah, do something, yeah. you know, just make something, you know, and, and that already is, is the first step to, to, to That's, being an Imagineer. That was my story. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> All right, well, thank you everybody so much for coming to our talk. Can we all give a big round of applause to the Walt Disney Imagineers who are joining us? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys. Thank you. This has been a real treat. Um, I'm very, very appreciative to our guests, Sarah, Dave, and Amy, for making time for us. And I also want to say a big thank you to the Media Lab community, especially yeah, the director's that. office and the communications team for giving all of us such this incredible opportunity to engage with Walt Disney Imagineering. And thank you, Emily. <laughs> Nicely <Yes>. done. <laughs> thank you. All right, thanks, everybody. <laughs>